Remember how you loved the stories at bedtime about princesses and fairy godmothers? Well, you may want to hold on tighter to your teddy bear and keep that nightlight on because these are not your mother's bedtime stories. Hello, welcome to Not Your Mother's Bedtime Story. I'm Colleen, and today I'm joined with my two sisters, Chrissy and Sherry, who Yo. drinks a lot still, and, and also my mo- mom, Karen. I'm still the middle child. Apparently, I still drink too much. <laughs> and I'm the mom responsible for all these guys. Today, we have two special guests that I'd like to introduce. It's actually my brother and sister-in-law, James and Priscilla. They are going to tell us about some paranormal experiences that they've had. And I'll, pre- I'll preface this a little bit. Um, I have, I've stayed in their house one time and, and I was trying to make a really good impression because I was just dating my now husband. And Priscilla is, was known, she was the baby of eight. And they had built her up to be the the mean sister. And so I was trying to make a a really, really good impression and and maybe had a little too much Asti Spamanti that night that I spent in in their home and and maybe like um maybe seasoned their their playground with a with a with a little bit of extra fertilizer that that night from a from a, a bad 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 drinking experience trying to impress the the mean sister but she but she's not so mean and and I'm so grateful that she's here today with us to to talk about her her stories in in her home so I'll uh, let them take it away hello I'm Jim and I'm Priscilla and um we lived in an, uh, an old apartment building in Pittsfield uh New Hampshire it was a duplex. It was a, well, it was a, originally a colonial, an old farmhouse, and it was um, probably 60 years ago. They separated and turned it into a duplex apartment. Um, we lived on one side, and the other side, our landlord, it was vacant for a while, and then our landlord rented it out to a business. Uh, it was a satellite dish business, so we were pretty much had the building to ourselves, which was great. It was like having our own house, the Beautiful being a yard. Yeah, big yard for the kids to play in. Um, it was right next to the highway, so that could be scary, but the kids were pretty good about staying in the yard. But we had moved in there in the fall of 1994. Our youngest daughter, Christine, was only a few months old. Sarah, yeah. Our oldest daughter, Sarah, had just turned two. And, you know, it was a great apartment. It had plenty of room for us. We knew about it because um, my Priscilla's sister-in-law Kathy had rented that same duplex, that side of the duplex, about God ten years prior to us. Yeah, I used to babysit my niece and nephew in that same apartment. So we were familiar with it, and the landlord um, that uh, owned the building was an old family friend on my side. My mom was best friends with his niece. Um, he was a well-respected contractor in the New England area. And somebody was a, a typical uh, typical New England Yankee, a very no-nonsense, no-BS kind of gentleman. So anyways, we <coughs> lived there for quite a while, and then we started noticing odd things happening. Yep. Um, the first time was so that the way the apartment was laid out, the first floor was a kitchen living room. Second floor was, and it was a half bath on the first floor. Second floor with two bedrooms, full bath. Third floor was... A finished so it could be used for anything. So when we moved in, um, the second floor, the kids would share a bedroom because they were still small enough. And then the other room was a playroom and we were on the third floor. So we, the first odd incident that happened while we were there, we were both laying in bed, kind of talking in the end of the day, getting ready to call it a night. And we had the baby monitor set on my wife's side of the bed. And we'd have the volume turned all the way up because I like to sleep with a fan. So she wanted to make sure she could hear the monitor. And it was one of those old monitors where it was a roll switch on the side. You turned it all the way down to turn it off. You rolled it all the way up for the volume. So we had it turned all the way up. We're sitting there talking and all of a sudden you could hear the, because there's the white noise on the monitor. You hear like, and you slowly heard it fade away and click. I'm like, oh, that's odd. 
Priscilla's thinking, well, maybe the battery died. I'm like, no, it's plugged in. Oh, yeah, that's right. It is plugged in. So I went over and I picked it up and I noticed that it had been turned all the way off. Now, we knew that it was at the highest setting because that's what we did every night yeah. and it had mysteriously turned off. I'm thinking, well, maybe, you know, maybe I didn't have it as high as I thought and it was close to the edge of switching off. I kind of tried to explain it away because I am a very, I was a very skeptical person. And it was 28 years ago when baby monitor technology was just kind of coming out. Sometimes it was kind of sketchy. People used to have rumors of picking up other people's CB communications on them. So we're like, okay, maybe it was an anomaly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we kind of blew it off a little bit. So probably a month or two later, I can't remember the timeline exactly. We're both laying in bed. Sissy's just about asleep. I am was watching some TV. I shut the TV off. And literally, so like I said, this is an old colonial. The windows in that building were the original, they're the wood frame windows that if you try and open those things, they'd it takes stink. two people, they'd swell. You know, because I had trouble with that window because we had put an air conditioner in the in it. Because we were on the Because it was hot floor. up there. <laughs> and it would take an act of God to try and get that window open and closed to get it in and out. It was always something I dreaded doing. So I'm laying in bed. She's almost asleep. And the the window was closed and it literally flew open. It, slam i mean like it made it, it, it flew was, open hard enough it made a loud enough noise it woke her i jumped out her. of bed i sat up and i looked at her and i'm like did you see that and she's like no what happened i'm like that window just flew open so of course i went over to close it and i'm struggling to pull it down because it's that time of year you know the moisture in the air it's swollen so it's hard to close so i'm like all right that's really weird that night you Gave me an ultimatum. Yeah, that night, that was the last night we slept up there because leading up to the window was probably the the biggest thing that ever happened. Um, just because you can't explain that that window, it took both of us to open it when it was time to open it in the spring, and that thing flew open on its own. Yeah, it'd so, be one I mean, thing if it had slammed shut, but yeah, yeah. slamming shut would have been something, but it flew open. And leading up to that, you know, we would, amongst our group of friends, we were the only ones that had small children. So we would often host gatherings at our house. And, you know, okay, most, sometimes our kids were there, but very often our kids were at my mother's house, especially if mom wanted to tie one on because I'd bring them to Grammy's so that I didn't have to get up with the girls in the morning. Um, and we're, we'd be sitting around the table playing cards, having, you know, just a, a get together with our friends and you'd hear footprints and they were definitely. Sounded little, like a small child running small around Small children footprints, not like a big boom, just like a little. I've heard mice and I know it was an old house. This was not a mouse. This literally sounded like people running across the floor. Little kids. So, you know, our friends would look at us and go, oh, the kids are out of bed. And we'd be like, eh, the kids, the kids are here. at my mom's. <laughs> so uh, a and, lot of. Go oh, ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say, and when I was a teenager and my sister lived there and my niece and nephew their playroom used to be right as you turn the corner to go up to the third floor, the finished part where our bedroom was, there was this little like bump out. Like and it's an where my niece used to keep her little kid kitchen set and we'd go in there and play chitchen. Occasionally you would get, it would just get cold and not like, not like a wind breezes and you're sitting in front of the window and you see the curtain. You would just feel this cold come down the stairs from the attic it's like what you hear when they talk about a cold spot it, it, it in, was in any of the paranormal it was shows. kind it was, of creepy and you would almost feel it go through you it wasn't like it was yes the air was cold it, you could yes. kind of feel it go it through moved you. to the point where <clears throat> later on curtis and emily who grew up in that house when they would come back and babysit our kids for us the same two i babysat in that house and refused to go to the third floor so they did the same. They, so <laughs> when we moved our bedroom to the second floor, so the kids shared a bedroom, we were in the other bedroom and, and the third floor became kind of like my man cave. I kept all my movies up there. I had a little TV. So it was like a second living room almost. When they would come over to babysit, 
they refused to go upstairs because they would want to watch a movie or something when the kids fell asleep. So they would make me go up. They'd tell me what they wanted to watch, make me go up, grab the movies and bring them down because of the cold spots and that feeling that they would always say it like they felt like they were being watched. Something was up there. Sorry to interrupt. I have a question. So everything that you guys experienced was always at the third floor, nothing ever on the, any of the other floors in the house. No. Well, no. So second or third, second or third floor. Uh, well, the first floor, there was a couple of instances. This one, I can't confirm if it was something paranormal, if it was just a toddler. Um, but there were two instances too, when we woke up and all the kitchen cabinets were open, uh, the top cabinets. That's always creepy. But it only happened a couple of times. The top oh, cabinets but, too, though? The top? Yeah. The top ones? No, it was just oh, the top. Just, just the drawers. It was just a cupboard. Oh, that's no toddler. That's not a toddler. That's no toddler. <laughs> But I always no. wondered because our toddler was also very, she was a climber. So sometimes, you know, if no, you get up, she would have needed to open the bottom ones to climb, climb up to the top ones. Yeah. No, uh-uh. Uh-uh. Nope. <laughs> yeah. The the other thing is uh, Sarah, our oldest daughter, um, she was probably, we lived there for quite a few six years, years, six years. So she was probably three or four. And they had a little table set that they would play in their room they'd have tea parties. and they'd have tea parties. Well, they always had an extra chair set oh. and we were like, Oh, who's coming? And we always thought, cause our youngest daughter had a bear and it got to the point where there were four chairs set oh. table set. One was for bear, one for Sarah, one for Christine. And who was the other one? And Sarah would just plain as day, look at us and go, it's for the blue angel. Oh. And I'm like, who's the blue angel? Oh. And she would say, she would tell us that she would wake up at night and the blue angel would talk to her. Oh. And they would play dollies and they would play kitchen. And their toy kitchen was exactly in the same spot that my niece's was. And, you know, at first I thought it was an imaginary friend. You know, I went to school for early childhood education. I know the kids do have imaginary friends. It's what everybody thinks. But this one kind of never, she didn't go away until we moved. And Christine would also start as she got older and started verbalizing, would talk about she goes, this girl. Oh yeah, the blue angel. I mean, at one point, you know, we would hear them up there talking to her. So, well, this is where the story gets interesting. This is where the story gets interesting. So. As if it hasn't been interesting to this point, because it's been very interesting. <laughs> well, because at this point, we're, we're kind of, all right, we're no, freaked no, out, no. but we're not necessarily we, scared because it was never, it was never. always been, it was never malevolent. It was always yes. just odd things. And so I decided, all right, I'm going to find out a little bit about the history of this house. So first person I talked to was my sister-in-law, Kathy, who had lived there with her husband, Max, and her kids. And I asked her point blank. I'm like, did anything weird ever happen when you were living here? And she's like, actually, there's a couple of instances. She's like the first when she was pregnant with their young, with their oldest, Emily. Their youngest. It was Curtis. Oh, it was. All right. It was Curtis. When she was right. pregnant with Curtis, her, uh, her middle child at that point, um, said that about three o'clock in the morning, they're woken up to banging on their front door. Max sits up. is kind of thinking, uh oh, you know, somebody banging on the door this early in the morning can't be good news. Something's going on. So he rushes downstairs. Well, the owner of the building, uh, the landlord, was living on the other side when they were there. And he w woke them up because he thought something was wrong with Kathy. He knew she was pregnant. She was getting close to her due date because he said he woke up and he heard a blood curdling scream coming from their side of the apartment. So he thought something was wrong. He knocked on the door to make sure everything was okay. Max is like, no, he woke us up slamming on the door. So... They're like, okay, that was a little weird. Maybe, you know, it is near highway. Maybe it was outside. Maybe it was something. Who knows? A little bit later, Kathy told us that, again, middle of the night, they're sleeping. Kathy gets jolted awake like somebody shook her to wake her up. She sits up. She sees Max is sound asleep. And she's thinking, all right, this is really weird because the only other people in her house are her, you know, an infant and a toddler. <clears throat> so she sits up. It's kind of unsettled by that feeling. And then she realizes she smells smoke. So she wakes Max up. He smells it too. So they immediately call the fire department. Fire department comes. It was the start of a chimney fire in their house. Uh, 
if they had slept through the night, it probably would have gotten worse and become a full on structure fire. But whatever woke her up, woke her up soon enough that she was able to call the fire department. There was minimal damage. Interestingly enough. I, so interestingly enough, I asked. Mm. And th- well, this is where it gets really interesting. So I then talked to the landlord of the building. Um, the no nonsense Yankee who Yankee. I'm like, all right, he'll he set, he'll set he anything straight. I'm stuff. thinking he's not going to believe in any of this stuff. To be fair. I never did either before I moved before into the we house. Lived there. So I talked to him and I'm like, uh, Mr. uh, is anything ever weird ever happened in this? Like in this apartment, he's like, Oh hell yes. This place is haunted. And I'm like <laughs> taken aback. I'm like, really? And he explained to me that he was raised in that house before they had turned it into a duplex. He was born and raised in that house it was a farm. in the early 1900s. It was a farmhouse. Prior to his family owning the building, that colonial had an attached, um, it was like a kitchen area, and then attached to that was a big barn. And if you look, you can still see where that barn used to sit. As a, it's an embankment now behind there, but it's kind of sunken in. And before his family bought the house, there was a house fire. And the mother and the young daughter were killed in that fire. And I kind of got a chill (laughs) when he told me that because I'm like, oh, my God, that explains everything. It totally explains Explains why it was a benevolent presence. And it was almost like they were kind of overseeing whoever stayed there, kind of protecting protecting us. And if it was a mother and a child, Mm -hmm. it explains why the children had a connection to probably the child spirit and yet the mother was protective and waking up Kathy and saying, you know, I don't want what happened to me to happen to you type of thing. Exactly. Uh, oh my God. And when he had told me that, I was like, that was the moment I get this chill. I'm like, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> it yeah. explained yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it is uncanny. Like you would, the kids mm-hmm. would be with us sitting in the living room watching TV and you'd hear the little footprints run across upstairs. <sighs> yeah. And that was, so Priscilla, when you heard those footsteps, when you guys were having those parties, this was prior to you knowing that a child had died in that house. Correct. What? So hearing the little pitter patter of tiny feet, anybody who has had a young child knows what it sounds like when little feet are yes. running. Oh my god. You goodness. know like when they sneak out of bed and you know they're like yeah. running over to the toy shelf and you it's know, like, they know that they're not yeah, supposed to yeah. get out of bed. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. But and even as a child, when I would babysit Emily and Curtis, my niece and nephew in that same home, you know, the third floor is where my sister Kathy used to she's a school teacher. So she had her office up there and her crafting supplies. And I used to help her wrap all their Christmas gifts. And I used to hate doing it at night. For so, It just, it, that area from the little alcove where Emily's, my niece's kitchen was, up through the third floor was, it just, it, it wasn't a normal cold. Like you get a cold spot in a house. Like Jim said, it moved through you. You'd be standing there, you'd find, you feel the cold, it comes right through you. You get the, like your hair stands yeah, up and you know yeah. that something is there. Something is there. Thankfully, it was. Yeah, it was, it was always, like I said, benevolent, but it also became kind of like, it was cool. We live in a haunted house. We live and it's with great. spirits that are obviously keeping, you know what I mean? It became this like, hey, it was like, you know, this is kind of a cool we, aspect of the like living Sarah, here now. We, we had our own little blue angel that was looking <laughs> out for our girls. Did did you guys ever do any any investigating to find out who they were? I never did. I never no. really, uh, once I had talked to him, I kind of was like, okay. That made the connection. Sense, but yeah, I, yeah I, you know, that is something actually probably we would be able to find out definitely. just in right Pittsfield right Town i mean yeah, yeah with records and everything yeah mm-hmm. but yeah it's funny you say that because i really never beyond that point it almost became like this it, it made sense and it was like okay hey cool we got now ghosts. we know <laughs> now we know where why it's why we are having these experiences yeah. But it was also great too the fact that a number of our friends or people that were over would experience this because then it's like all yes. right we're not crazy <laughs> and your grandparents 
used to party in that house <laughs> with the their friends back in the 50s and used to say that weird stuff would happen then. They never went into details with us. And sadly, they're no longer with us for us to ask. But it is amazing how that one house has connected our two families with us, my sister and her husband, your grandfather and yep. his friends. Yeah, all tied back to that same house and the weird noises that you would hear mm. in that house. We had the opportunity to buy the place when our landlord, um, he was getting older and he was kind of getting rid of some of his assets, shoring stuff up. He wanted to sell it to us. And unfortunately, we couldn't afford it at the time because we thought, oh, my God, I would love to own. You know, imagine owning, you know, because I'm a big horror movie guy. I love that kind of stuff. I'm, you know, that's my my bread and butter. You know, I love horror movies. I love I am not. Stuff. And I love Halloween. Out. <laughs> and I always thought, oh, how would be cool to, to own and live in a haunted house. This is well, weird. and as long as it's not like a, a benevolent, like you said, it seems all pretty benevolent. Yeah. Like everything's nice. I mean, a little bit poltergeisty with the cabinets opening and the window opening. But overall, I mean, more protective, more just mischievous and not not out to get you or not out to hurt you. I yeah. so. just want to let you know that they're there. Yeah. Yeah. And I always wondered too, if like the cabinet stuff or the windows were like, like daily routines the mom might have done at that time. Yeah. You know, yeah. they kind of, they, yeah. they say they're that there. sometimes the spirit will kind of do what they did in their past life, especially, yeah. especially if they died yeah. suddenly yeah. and it's like, they yeah. don't know that they're dead or, you know, or something. I'm, I'm not an expert on it, but just the stuff that I've read, and, you know, they say the sometimes blue- that they'll kind of continue what they would do in life. And the blue angel would, yeah. our oldest daughter was quite the acrobat. So we actually had to put, uh, when you walked into the apartment, you had to step up to get into the house. So if you're a toddler on the outside, you can't reach the handle. She could reach the door on knob on the inside to get out, but she couldn't let herself back in. Um, we had to put a lock at the top because she would let herself out in the middle of the winter. She'd wake up at like four in the morning and just go outside to play. Her swing set was up on the top of the hill. When I think it was actually the day we moved into that house was probably the first time that something weird happened. Remember, Christine was already in her crib. We thought Sarah was in her room, her new room that my sisters had just helped me set up. We turned our backs for a second and Sarah was sitting on the double yellow line in the middle of Levitt Road. And a car had stopped because it had seen her and she comes back in the house and she goes, I'm going to play with the blue girl. And that was like the very first. Oh, Oh. Oh, oh, no. Oh, yes. Because I was just, oh, my God, my I'm going to lose my child because she's going to go sit and play in the middle of the street. Yeah. Um, They I always felt like the girls were safe there. Like, you know, how no matter how much you watch your kids, there's there's always that one second where mom's trying to pee or, you know, taking care of the little one. So you turn your back on the big one for five seconds and five seconds is all it takes. I always felt like at that house that I wasn't alone watching them, if that makes any sense. And I am not a horror fan. Um, I don't watch horror movies. (laughs) I hate going to haunted houses because they scare me. (laughs) And I was really quite the skeptic until we lived there. And I experienced those things that were unexplainable. And it just, it, it, it definitely made me a believer that there is so much that we don't know. So, so the one night, the one night I, I did stay there, you put me on the third floor. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I am known as the mean no, sister, you're not. right? No, you're not. <laughs> Although, no, I must say that on that a, night, I think the other spirits intent- had you such that, that you experienced the first ones. 
Well, you gotta see her. You gotta, you gotta test it out. See if she passes muster. You know, let's, let's, let's put her up on the third floor. She stays she tonight. She's night good. In the third floor. Yeah. She might handle the family. Yeah. Uh, now it comes out. Now it comes out. Colleen, you're you're. I tell you, I had so much Aussie Sumanti right that night. I probably they they probably could have levitated me, and I would have would not have remembered. <laughs> Such an odd choice. Aussie Spumanti. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, right? That was my fault. Right. I used to drink that all the time. Lord. Colleen probably shouldn't have had any. <laughs> well, that and it was celebratory, too, because you were like, yay, a girlfriend of Bill's I don't hate. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Finally, one that I wanted what to are, eat. Uh, yeah, well, I just remembered that I, I just needed to make it to your house without throwing up in your car. Or you'd hate me forever. Oh. <laughs> At least I made it to the playground, but no, no. Oh. Yeah. sorry. <laughs> well, that was a fun night. <laughs> we keep talking about the the blue angel, the blue child. So yes, I so the the story was that they perished in a fire. So. Is it possible that this child died of asphyxiation and potentially was, or or could it have been from like fire soot or something? Like what you know? Why is it the color blue? You know what what are they seeing? Was any did was anybody described? Did they describe what they looked like? Were like was their skin blue or Sarah? Sarah used to tell us she glowed and she glowed blue. Oh, okay. So. That's why we just assumed she I, was. I think it's just a child's aura, like, like a an blues, ethereal, ethereal aura. blue yeah. silhouette. That's yeah. what I'm. I assume. I mean, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, that went on the whole time. The we whole lived time there. we lived there. Um, I would love to. Um, I don't know who ended up moving in after. It was actually um, somebody else did buy it, and they renovated the whole building. And I would, I don't know who it is. I would love to contact them to see if there's still stuff happening or because sometimes with hauntings too, they tend to stop after fashion too. So I don't know. Yeah. Sometimes they get worse if there's a renovation, if things are changing and yeah. it's not to their liking, they could, you know, be, but just go knock well on too, the door, yeah. Jim, just go, hey, what was can I, yeah. <laughs> you know, I can't count how many times I've thought about doing that. I want to say, hey, I used to live here. I loved that yeah. house. <laughs> Um, interestingly enough, when we bought this house, uh, Sarah was in second grade. Christine was a kindergartner. Um, so they were seven and five and Sarah asked us if there were going to be ghosts in this house. Oh. <laughs> she doesn't know any different, you know, wow. oh. if you grow she up, kind of figured out right? what was going on. Well, and if they, she wasn't terrified at all. And he, Keep in mind, our, our our girls grew up, you know, with his, as soon as she could speak, she walks by and Jim's carrying her and he passes the zombie poster. And Sarah's sucking her little thumb and she pulls her thumb out and goes, ooh, wormies, because of the worms coming out of his eye. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. Because, yeah, I have a bunch of like horror movie memorabilia posters and stuff like that, so... She was always afraid it would freak them out. I was out. like, if the kids have nightmares, we can't. But I think growing up around it and, you know. They, yeah, they never. They're both into it like I am now, too. So <laughs> I, They would go to haunted houses. I'd sit outside so, and drink so, hot so, cider. So, so Jim, Jim is downplaying. He says he's got some stuff. Like, yeah. Jim, Jim no, no, I forgot to preface this in the introduction. Jim, when VHSs were the rage, Jim had, I think, every single VHS movie of every single horror movie that was ever made. Then I think then it graduated to DVDs, and and now he's got a uh, he's got a plethora of memorabilia that I think has out even outgrown your your basement your basement um, showcases downstairs. He... Yes. yes. So my Colleen, we've bought those same movies on VHS on DVD. On Blu-ray, and now we're moving to 4K. So I've t we've technically purchased the same movie four times. The picture quality gets better each time. Yes. 
All right. Well, well, it's a Halloween party. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, I could do. Uh, yeah, my basement is Halloween year round. Year round. Yeah, we, up until COVID, because um, they haven't done it since, we used to do a haunt. Um, the King Pine. Deuce and Bill, Colleen's husband and son, did it with us one year when we did the. It was a, uh, actually, a virus Deuce, outbreak. Yeah, Deuce <laughs> and Ella did it one year. The year we did um, Camp Crystal Lake. Yes. Because Deuce was the one that we would pull out of the lineup. So we had it set up. Uh, Colleen's son, uh, uh, Deuce, he came up to our haunted house and he's like, all right. He's like, what What do you want me to do? I'm like, actually, I'm, I'm, what you're going to do is, isn't is as elaborate as a scare of, you know, dressing up or whatnot. But what I want you to do is going to scare the crap out of the patrons. So we'd let X amount of people in every time. So Gilbert was just dressed as, you know, a typical eight-year-old kid. He would go through with each group and we had it planned. I would come out from behind a curtain and grab him and pull him behind screaming. And that would <laughs> oh, freak God. everyone else out in his queue. They're like, they grabbed they the just grabbed a little kid. <laughs> and then he would scurry around back. And get back do in line again. and go through, and he'd do that all night long, and he absolutely loved it. And it scared the oh, crap out of every patron that went oh, through that building. Funny. Yeah, well, I think well, Colleen has a special treat for you as far as some extra bonus stories to. Uh... So, um, because Jim is such a horror movie fan, I thought it would be perfect to talk about the weird occurrences that happen surrounding the Poltergeist movie. It's one of, one of my all time favorite, uh, horror movies. And I, to be honest with you, I think it took me probably 10 times watching it before I could watch it all the way through without hiding, hiding my eyes at, at certain spots. But <laughs> Oh man, Colleen, we used to watch that. I remember like, gosh, I was five, you were eight then. So we would watch that movie on HBO probably like three times a day because they would play it that often. So oh, yeah. You guys could recite lines. <laughs> well, and I know I mentioned this in our very first episode, but I had a resemblance to Carol Ann from the movie. And I think I was watching it <laughs> At the same age that she was in that movie, and it didn't bother me a bit. But yeah, I'm sure a lot Nelson. of folks listening know that there, right? There are, you know, incidences that have happened on the scene of that movie, and and two actors and actresses within that movie. But just to say that we're talking about the original, not the the remake um, that that occurred in 2000, 2000 Can't remember the year, but. Yeah. So one of one of the scary scenes that I it took me a while to watch it all the way through without hiding my eyes is when Joe Beth Williams character Diane falls into the swimming pool during the end of the movie and skeletons are popping up all over and mm-hmm. and the actors in the movie assumed that the swimming pool the swimming pool <laughs> The actors have assumed that those skeletons were fake, but they were actually real skeletons that were used in the filming of that movie because they had found that fake skeletons were too expensive and, and um, to be made out of rubber. So they were actual real skele- real skeletons. Interesting fact about up until about 10 years ago, you could buy real skulls on eBay. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I know this because we oh, have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I suppose you bought one. <laughs> yes, it was UCLA was selling off all of their old wow. medical the stuff they teaching to tools because to most medical schools now use the plastic replicas because then they can take them apart and do all of that. And they were selling some of the old ones, so I'm like, ooh, that would look good in my collection. <laughs> right? Did it? Did it come with a? Did it come with a brain that was Abby Abby Normal somewhere? <laughs> Abby Normal. <laughs> well, the first three years we had it, it was just kind of stuck on a shelf, and I felt like it was just bad juju. You know what I mean? I felt like that was that was a real human being at one point in time. Granted, they donated yeah. their body to medical science, mm-hmm. and it was legit, but. When he finally listened to me and gave it, now it is in a glass cabinet. A glass cabinet 
It is properly displayed. It's like we're paying respect to it. Things got much better when we started, <laughs> when it it had a home and it was, yeah, creepy, okay. creepy. I did not know that how many skeletons were in that pool. Oh my God. No, it was a number of them. A lot of them. Yeah. They, like Colleen said, they used them because they looked better. And then they, you know, they added with makeup to make them look like rotting oh. corpses. But. Yeah. I didn't know you had a real skull in your house. <laughs> I might think twice about sleeping over at your house now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's funny too. When I got it shipped to me, I had it shipped to where I work. I work with state police. Well, one of the crime lab guys came over because when I got it, I opened the box and my, you know, all my coworkers were creeped out. So I'd set it up on a shelf until I was able to bring it home. One of the gentlemen from the crime lab comes over and he's like, oh, my God, is that real? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, fascinating. He picks it up. He's looking at it. He's like, you know, if you want, I could take this and I could get a DNA sample from it and tell you who they were. And I'm like, no, I don't want to (laughs) know. But he thought it was fascinating. He's like, oh, I could could find out who this person was. I thought he was going to pick it up and be like, they died from uh, blunt force trauma. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, the skull is perfect. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Go on, Colleen. Older guy stories. So, and of course, the, one of the very tragic things was right after the movie was released in 1982 that Dominique Dunn, who played the oldest daughter, Dana, she was murdered by in her own driveway by her abusive ex-boyfriend and was on life support but died several days later. And it, yeah, it's insane. It, it, the movie definitely had a lot of like curses around it. Um, when the the second one, the sequel, the Poltergeist Two: The Other Side, they were concerned about the use of the real skeletons on the set from the first film. So the Native American actor Will Sampson performed an ex- exorcism on the second set film in 1984. And according to the to Joe Beth Williams, he went to the set late at night to do it himself. And the next day, apparently, the cast felt relieved after they did that exorcism on the the skeletons used in the second movie. Um, They also had weird things in that movie where Julian Beck, who starred as Kane, he died of stomach cancer at the age of 60 um, right before he accepted his role. And then months before the film even came out in theaters, Will Sampson, the actor who performed the exorcism, died of malnutrition and kidney failure at age of 53. Just like lots of tragic things. And of course, you know, the, the probably the most tragic thing is the death of Heather O'Rourke who played Carol Ann. And she died at the age of 12, several months before the release of Poltergeist three, the final chapter in the series. Do you remember too, there was a couple other ones. Did you hear the one about the actor who played Ryan? I can't think of what his name is as an actor, but he was on an airplane and the flight attendant recognized him and then moved him up to first class because she recognized him as an actor and that plane crashed. And had he been sitting in the spot where he had originally been assigned, he would have died. But because he was moved Jeez. up to first class, he would have survived too. Yeah, it was that uh, uh, he was one, uh, 27 out of the 51 people on board of that, that air flight in March of 1992. Yeah, he, but he was, he actually survived, but yet another reason why people claim the movie is cursed. It's crazy. Or did you also, like, I remember hearing that, like, Joe yeah. Beth Williams, like, every time she would come back to her trailer or wherever she was living while she was filming, like, the pictures would always be, like, sideways. Pictures were, were moved, right? Yeah, and then she would turn them before she would leave every day, and then when she'd come back, they would be moved again. I'm like, what? Oh, a lot of interesting little tidbits too, like when the uh, paranormal investigator looks in the mirror and his face starts peeling. He starts peeling his face off. Steven Spielberg, who wrote the movie and wanted to direct it, but was doing ET at the same time, would often come to the set because he really was bummed out that he couldn't direct that as well. So he requested the director, who he hired to do that film, Toby Hooper, who is most famous for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He asked to be the hands that peel the face off of the prosthetics. So when you see that scene, those are Steven Spielberg's hands pulling all of the meat off of the face because he really wanted to do that scene. Huh, I haven't heard that one. That's creepy. 
Yes, J- J- Jim knows. Jim knows so much about movies. He actually was Mr. He actually did a stint as Mr. Mr. Movie. movie at the uh, the the local community theater when they would show um, classic movies. He would always give a, a spoof and or a spiel about each movie and and give lots of details. So he he not only is he a collector, but he has he's a wealth of knowledge of, of about all movies, not just horror movies. Yes, for horror movies are my preference, but yeah, old movies. I love all old movies. So yeah, God, I could. Yeah, and uh, so the other thing about Poltergeist did that was the thing too was Steven Steven Spielberg like he had a choice. He had a choice with Poltergeist and E. T. and you know he made his decision. But they also talk about so Robbie, the the middle child in the the movie Poltergeist, and he actually the scene with the clown. So we all remember the scene with the clown where the clown yes. is, you know, who who the hell looks under the bed? Come on. You know it's under there. It's going to grab you. Like, <laughs> why are you doing this? Yeah. You, you no, throw the jacket over the dang thing and then it comes back and you're like, okay, yeah, it may or may not be under the bed. Yeah, it's, it's freaking under the bed. Like, let's all be honest. Well, no, it's actually right behind you. Yeah. He wasn't under the bed. Yeah. It was right on the top when he and, was. He but was there was an incident it. on the film where he was actually being strangled by the clown. And if it hadn't been for Steven Spielberg intervening because he was a producer on the movie, not directing it, he was producing it, it could have been a lot worse. So it's just these things. And I still remember there was a story about the tree. So the tree in Poltergeist, and help me remember if anybody else remembers, there's a story about the tree. So we all know the tree that kind of comes in and grabs Robbie and, you know, sucks him down. I think this was like a vision of Steven Spielberg. Like he had this vision of a a creepy tree and he wanted to bring it to life. And it's like, who doesn't have like a gigantic tree, especially, you know, out east or anywhere, you know, they, they have these mature trees and thinking about these things that are just going to come in and it, it, that it basically like tried to eat him. It just, that creeps me out. I mean, that was, you know, made up in the mind of, of this brilliant director and, you know, came to life on the screen. So yeah. super cool. Yeah. And I think that was one of only two movies of all the movies he's directed. That was, I think one of only two that he ever wrote himself that and close encounters. So he's got a very active imagination. This means something. Yes. <laughs> this means. <laughs> Thank you. This is. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. You braved a half hour of audio yes, difficulties and uh, everything else to to be here today. And, and I so will say, sorry about that. Hey, you know, we are willing to do a follow up on on that house and you know investigate the history and the happenings of, of what might have, have gone down there because I feel like there's got to be some records of that and we can we can definitely turn that into a future. I'm episode. sure there are and I could probably very easily find that out too. So I will yeah. I will look into that. Go oh, knock gosh. on that door, Jim. Yeah. Say, hey. <laughs> well, my dad is a selectman of that town right now, so he probably has access to those files, you know, if there are town the records. Historical yeah. records. Yep. I'm, I imagine the town library would have those too. Yep. Those, and if there was a fire back in yeah. the late 1800s, there's there might be records of it there. Yeah. Yeah. It made a believer out of me, and I was very much a skeptic. Yeah, me too. And and that's that's huge. I mean, that's huge. It's the it's the things that you know we can't explain. We're going into it thinking this is not possible, but yet you're feeling it, you're living it, and you say, yep. I don't have another explanation for this. This has nope. got to be something beyond, beyond us, you, beyond you this start world. Look, you start looking into it more and you realize that, you know, it's a very common, you know, people who've had those experiences are very similar, mm-hmm. very similar. You know, you... you and I, I think it's interesting that you're such a horror buff, but yet you're such a skeptic too. Yeah. So very interesting. You like to watch it, but you're like, it's not real. And now yeah. you're like, oh, I like to watch it and it might be real. Jim has always been fascinated with how they do it, like how they make the movies. Well, I find it interesting because they're actually, you know, um, there are a number of scientists that are actually, you know, there's always been paranormal activity investigators, but now there is like hard science scientists that are really looking into 
What happens to our subconscious? Well, what happens, the theory, I'm going to explain it poorly, but it was fascinating. I was watching a show. There's a number of quantum physics scientists and quantum physics is like the really out there part of science. And their explanation is, you know, that we all have energy. We all share the same energy with the universe. And we're all made of the same stuff. And their, their correlation they're making is a lot of yeah. times with a haunting or a poltergeist activity. It's usually that person's life ended abruptly. Like, mm -hmm. it's almost like when they died, there was energy that was left behind. They said it's almost like an echo. You know what I mean? And that energy kind of keeps replaying out, replaying out, replaying out until eventually it diminishes and becomes part of whatever, everything. And that they're actually starting to study the, the theory of that, that. There's a possibility that they maybe might not be there. It might be energy that was left behind from, because you always hear about at places where there was an accident, a car accident, somebody died, that weird stuff happens there. And their thought process being, it was like, it happened so suddenly. It's like that energy didn't, go where it was supposed to when you die naturally or yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, again, I thank you guys. This was a really, really good yeah. creepy story. And like yeah. you said, it just emphasizes that we, we don't we know. Don't we don't know, know why, nope. why things happen the way they do. Right. And um, yeah, it's a really good creepy we story. We don't know, so. but we sure like talking about no, it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, now it's fascinating. Right. Today, right. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. It's so fascinating. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I, mean, like, I believe in them now. Week, so. I do believe in <laughs> yeah. ghosts now. Yeah. I do believe in ghosts now. Right. Um, you sound you sound like the cowardly lion on Wizard of Oz. Like, <laughs> I, 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 I do believe in ghosts. I do believe in ghosts. That's right. Oh, well, again, thank you guys. And if you hear anything else or if you find anything else out about the house, we'll we'll give an update to our, Absolutely. our listeners. Absolutely, I will look into and keep that. that keep that skull in that box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <know. laughs> yes. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I guess that leaves just one thing. Take it away, Mom. Thank you for listening, and remember. Keep that night light on. Good night, sweet dreams. If you have a story to share, please send it to Not Your Mother's Bedtime Story at gmail.com. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Not Your Mother's Bedtime Story. And please help us grow by following us on your favorite podcast platform, leaving us a positive review, and telling a friend. Thank you for your support.